Assalamu alaikum viewers. This is uh, Sir Faraz Kearney from Pedami Hub. Today we are once again, we are joined by Leslie Terabesi from Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum brother, how are you? Wa alaikum salam. I am very good. Thank you brother. How are you? Good, good. Uh, welcome back to the show again. Thank uh, you. Today, My... today we will be talking about a very important subject about uh, uh, the fabrication of revelation in Islam. And you have done a lot of research on that. You have published one of the books in, back in May of this year, and also your books are coming up about the same issue, which is a very serious issue. I want you to please uh, share your research with our audience. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brother Safra, as well. Let's just briefly do a dua to Allah to guide us to say only that which is true and correct and that which is pleasing to Him. And let us pray to uh, Him to guide us not to say anything that is not true or false and that is not pleasing to Him. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, um, uh, in the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful. You see, I have uh, uh, spent 15 years in the uh, sector, the uh, Islamic sector, uh, five years at the university and 10 years at the research center. And uh, after my uh, coming close to the uh, my stay at the research center, uh, the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies here in Malaysia, I began to realize there were some questions that were, were we were not really addressing in our collective, uh, you know, research uh, uh, projects. And one of those issues, yes, and one of those issues was the relationship between the Quran and Sunnah. Now, this uh, the relationship between Quran and Sunnah, uh, you know, in the classical tradition, uh, we know what it is, but if I may just preface very briefly that uh, to I just would like to indicate that I'm not the only one who is concerned about this issue, uh, obviously, of course. I would just like to mention two names, not that I want to drop names, but just to highlight to the viewers that uh, this is something that is also of concern to, to mainstream Sunni scholars. Taha Jabir Alwani wrote a book called Reviving the Balance in, it was published in 2017 and it, he talks precisely about this, how to how to restore the balance between the Quran and the Sunnah, because according to him, and I basically agree with his opinion, although I think I can say, uh, say without uh, boasting that uh, I kind of arrived at it independently, actually, I only read, read his book after I published my paper on, uh, on the subject. So, and another fellow is uh, Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, who was, uh, I think, a rector of the International Islamic University here in Malaysia for some time. He wrote a book uh, called The Quranic uh, Worldview uh, that was published in 2011. And in it, he says something very similar, that what we need to do is to recover the Quranic perspective, because it appears that the traditions or the Hadiths have really overshadowed uh, the Quran to a significant extent. As we know, 80% of the Sharia is basically based on uh, the Hadith rather than the Quran. And just what a one other name I would like to mention, uh, this uh, Sheikh Hassan uh, Farhan al-Maliki uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, who has been also uh, calling uh, the attention of Muslims back to the Quran, because he also basically argues that somehow the traditions of the Prophet, uh, peace be on him, have in a way eclipsed or overshadowed uh, the message and the Quran itself. So now uh, coming to the analysis, uh, I kind of realized that for many Muslims, uh, of course, we have the issue of Quran illiteracy. So many people can recite the Quran without comprehending what they say. But there's another very serious problem. I think a number of Muslims have uh, somehow, uh, somehow they seem to confuse the words of Allah Ta'ala with the words of uh, the Hadith. And I think that is a, a very dangerous uh, slippery slope to, to, to be on. But uh, this uh, equation of the uh, or equating the hadith with the uh, revelation actually has a, a foundation in one hadith according to which the prophet allegedly said that I was given two things, the Quran and something equal to it, the hadith. Another rendition of this particular tradition says that uh, is very similar, but just uses a soft word rather than, instead of using the word equal, it uses the word similar. And uh, tradition says in this form that uh, the prophet allegedly said, I was given something, uh, I was given two things things, the Quran and something like it, uh, the Hadith in other words. So this is this Hadith is highly problematic because it seems to imply that somehow the Quran and uh, uh, you know that traditions are equal. Uh, the exegetes uh, in the uh, trad uh, traditional Islam have in fact openly declared that the Hadith uh, are, uh, the traditions are revelation. They called it the second revelation. They maintained that the Sunnah is revelation 
<laughs> let me ask you, uh, yeah, yeah, way, uh, Leslie. Go ahead. Before we go on, it's very important to clear this thing. Uh, but there's no such thing in Quran itself that Allah has given him two different things. It's, it's coming all from Hadith. So in Hadith, they're saying there is a Hadith saying that Prophet was given two things. But there's nothing mentioned about this in Quran. Is that clear, right? Is that correct? Absolutely. And in fact, I, I'm, I was coming to that, but it doesn't uh, hurt to bring it uh, forward. Yes, uh, there is no support at all in the Quran for the so-called concept of dual revelation. In Arabic, the expression uh, says, uh, the two revelations. There's no support for that. By the way, Aisha Musa has a paper on academia on the concept of dual revelation and uh, the viewers can get more information uh, on this issue uh, from her uh, in that paper so yes the quran uh, does not uh, endorse uh, a second uh, revelation none whatsoever in fact uh, the quran once we're on a subject since we're on a subject does not even mention the sunnah of the prophet quite frankly so um, uh, the arguments which are commonly used uh, in uh, by traditional muslims to uh, highlight to us that we are obligated to follow the sunnah together with the quran uh, normally use the uh, verse in the quran according to which we are supposed to obey allah and the prophet uh, I mean, the, the messenger rather. So once again, the transition from uh, obey the messenger to follow Bukhari, I think is a huge step. And I don't believe it logically follows. It is what we call in log uh, logic a non sequitur. But that's another issue. We can uh, come back to it later. But my concern is that when, uh, you know, the exegetes, uh, classical exegetes, exegetes made uh, the Sunnah equal, uh, made it revelation, they declared that this is a revelation. I, I mean, one of the thoughts I had, and it wasn't uh, uh, in the early stages of my research on this issue, kind of have to admit came a bit later, but I realized that, hey, wait a minute, people are telling us that the traditions are revelation, uh, but uh, the um, these traditions are coming from narrators who are not prophets, and they are definitely not the words of Allah. So how can they be a revelation if they are not the words of Allah? In fact, when you look more closely, we realize that the uh, ahadis, the traditions, are not even the words of the Prophet. The, why? Because uh, the narrations of the hadith are basically the words of the narrators. They are all paraphrases. To my knowledge, there is not a single verbatim hadith that uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, constitutes the exact words of the Prophet. In other words, they have all been paraphrased by the various transmitters and narrators. And what we get essentially at the end of the Isnad or the chain of narration is something that the Prophet may have said, but it's definitely not something that he uh, said verbatim. In fact, Abu Hanifa apparently insisted that only verbatim uh, hadith or traditions could be could be accepted, could be considered as sahih. Yet we here we have six collections of traditions which all claim to be sahih, and they contain narrations, none of which actually represents the exact words of the Prophet. So how did this happen? We are informed that the uh, collectors of the hadith were very serious scholars who, who had very high standards, but quite frankly, how on what grounds could anyone call a tradition as authentic if it is not the exact or verbatim uh, uh, words of the prophet? I am puzzled. Uh, I wish somebody will help me out with this. Uh, the other thing I, I, I want to uh, highlight is that, you know, when you call uh, the Hadith revelation, yeah, doesn't it imply that the people who narrated them or collected them, that they are prophets? Another issue is, how could this uh, revelation come after the revelation of the Quran? We have been informed that uh, the uh, prophet was the seal of the prophets, and but now we have a second revelation coming after uh, the revelation of the Quran. So uh, on what grounds did the, the ulama accord the rank of revelation to, uh, to the hadith and in fact insisted that it is equal or similar to uh, the, uh, the Quran? Another point we need to remember is that the Quran makes it very clear that there is nothing like it. Uh, the Quran is a unique document. We have the concept of the ijaza or inimitability of the Quran, yet we are being informed here that there is something, uh, that, that the traditions uh, are, you know, uh, uh, something like something like the Quran. When the Quran says there's nothing like it, there's another right. contradiction. Uh, yeah, nothing Not parallel to Quran. 
Period. Exactly, exactly. But we are informed that uh, the Hadith constitute, uh, you know, a, a, a parallel uh, a system of legislation. Another problem with this whole elevation of the Hadith to the rank of revelation is that we have been informed uh, by Allah uh, Ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah verses 44, 45 and 47. And I think I mentioned this in, in our last talk. Uh, and these verses say that anyone who judges by what Allah did not reveal is a Zalim, Kafir and a Fasik, that means a wrongdoer, uh, disbeliever and a rebel. So now if uh, the uh, Hadith are really a revelation as pe uh, some ulama want us to believe, then there should be no problem. I concede that. But if the Hadith are not revelation, then someone has a very big problem. You know what I'm saying? Right. So you, you brother Leslie, you're saying that majority, most of them right now, what's going on, they're following just the narrators without I mean, going to the Quran itself and see what exactly Allah says. They're basically well, following the narrators, basically. Yeah, that's another that's another issue. You see, uh, as we talked uh, in one of my books, the six waves that uh, transformed the religion of peace into political Islam. I identify at least uh, six uh, stages where the process of the gradual elevation of tradition really. Uh, transformed our understanding of the Quran uh, of Revelation because uh, and I, perhaps I could put it this way uh, there was uh, as I mentioned before one could think of the entire process of the gradual elevation of tradition at the expense of revelation and reason uh, we can uh, think of it as a, as a process of gradual elevation uh, of uh, tradition which started with first the elevation of the tradition or the hadith above Akko or uh, the, the uh, reason. And there's even a very popular saying uh, among the, uh, the ulama that, you know, uh, nakko, uh, uh, the, the akko, the reason is subordinated to the uh, nakko. In other words, a reason has to take a backseat compared to, uh, you know, uh, is a lower ranking uh, source compared to tradition. So that was the first as it were eclipse if you want to if you want to think of it in those terms but so the then the tradition uh, the body of hadith and the sunnah continued its rise then it came to the second stage uh, where it became as we just talked uh, it became equal to it became revelation first and moreover it became equal to revelation so this is a phenomenal development and i would say i, I would suggest that this is where the so called fabrication of revelation uh, took place because I personally don't believe that uh, tradition or the hadith, being the words of human beings, uh, can possibly be characterized as revelation. I think that is one of the biggest errors that the classical ulama uh, committed. Apart from, of course, the subordination of reason to, to tradition, that was another uh, move that I don't think was helpful at all. Because we must remember that the very process of the ident authentication of the hadith, of the traditions, relied on the use of reason. How else can you decide whether this hadith is sahih or uh, daif or, uh, you know, uh, Hassan, if you don't use your reason? Of course you have to use your reason. So it seems that after the uh, hadith scholars, it seems that after the hadith scholars use their reason to classify all the, uh, you know, hadiths or the traditions, then they decided that it was, now we don't need the reason anymore and we can dispose of it and, and declare it now to be uh, subordinated to the very faculty that helped us to identify them in the first place. That is another contradiction, inconsistency in the methodology here. So what we are looking at here actually is a, a serious problems in the methodology, uh, not only in the, of course, the authentication of the uh, traditions, but in other areas as well, which uh, hopefully I can get to shortly. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, another thing, brother, uh, Leslie, I noticed something very, which is kind of dangerous. You know, when you talk to the people about different concepts, and they say, well, this is this is the way it is, and this. Then we ask them, okay, can you show us from Quran? And then trying to figure out where it is in Quran, they could not find it. Then we ask them, so how you know and where are you getting all this information? Then that's what they say that has been, you know, they've been told about this, and that's been going on. Everybody is doing it. Obviously, it has to be Allah's word. But when in fact the fact is when you look at the quran there's nothing about this no mention about this so this has been going on for so long and the people don't even realize 
what they're doing or what they're accepting is not even the part of the Quran. This is the most dangerous thing I have witnessed. I mean, uh, absolutely, you're right. And in fact, it has already happened before in Christianity. There was a gradual elevation of Jesus until he became a prophet and even a son of God and part of the Trinity. I call this uh, this process of the gradual elevation of, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, for instance, the traditions in Islam, and not just the traditions. I call it. Uh, I think of it as a kind of creeping polytheism bit by bit more and more things are go, uh, treated as sacred including uh, the ulama the imams are sometimes followed in defiance of the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is a statement taken directly from a paper by zaki badawi who i edited his paper and uh, i have a quotation uh, of this uh, statement in in my work as well so this is very dangerous when people we begin to follow the words of human being in defiance of the words of allah ta'ala and we, we we are confusing once we elevate uh, the hadith to the to to be an equal or to, to the quran and if, i mean doesn't that sound blasphemous to you if we yeah. agree that allah has no equals how can his words have any equals i, yes, I don't see that point. very good point yeah i don't see that so of course, they do not explicitly say that, uh, the, you know, the uh, Allah has a partner. But I remember one time I asked a, a gentleman here in Malaysia. He's a senior person in a, a Islamic uh, books publications company. And I asked him that when I, I pointed out to him that we in the OK, maybe I shouldn't be too critical, but I noticed in the mosques, you see two names side by side on the wall of uh, written in equal letters, equal size, I implying equality, in other words, and the, the name of Allah. And beside it is the name of the Prophet. Now, is this right? Should we be doing that? So I asked him, uh, are the two uh, partners, you know, the, the, the Prophet, I mean, uh, Allah and the Prophet? And he, I couldn't get an answer from him. He wouldn't answer me. He was silent. So then I asked him a, a similar question. I asked him, well, are they equal in your view? So, and he had to think about it. And uh, after a while he said, no, they are not equal. So we are cautioned in the Quran over and over again, not to ascribe any partners to Allah uh, and not to make anything equal uh, to Allah. And yet people fall into this tra trap of, uh, you know, elevating uh, the prophet to a position of near equality perhaps in some minds, even of equality with Allah. And that is already, uh, doesn't that amount to polytheism or shirik? I don't know. Uh, I don't want to make a, uh, express an opinion that, but it comes pretty close to it uh, if it is yeah. not already happening right. yeah so um this is a very dangerous thing that uh, you know christians used to refer to jesus as divine but i have heard muslim uh, um, uh, mufti uh, refer to the sunnah of the prophet muhammad as divine so now how big is the difference between the sunnah of the prophet being divine and the prophet being divine i mean we seem to be heading in a similar direction this is very dangerous, very dangerous and, yeah. Not only that, in fact, there's a hadith. I don't reject all the hadith. Those hadith that, uh, you know, agree with the Quran, I can accept as a source of uh, information about the past, but not as a source of legislation. I, I think the uh, for legislation, we should rely entirely on the Quran. Uh, and uh, we can derive laws, uh, I mean, even based on things like uh, uh, public interest from the principles which are already in the Quran. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this uh, there is a hadith uh, and it was reported in the Saudi edition of the Quran, uh, translated by uh, Muhsin Khan and Hali uh, Takiuddin Hilali. And according to this hadith, the Prophet said to his people, please do not praise me so much like the Christians praise Jesus that in the end, they uh, finally they ended up worshiping him. So this is a this is a danger. And in fact, I remember going to uh, one mosque here, uh, uh, and uh, when I looked on the ceiling, I saw two names written uh, twice each. The name of the prophet was written uh, in this huge, you know, dome twice, and the name of Allah was written also twice on the same huge dome, and they were written in the same size, and it implied equality. After some months, after some time, I came and I saw some painting equipment there, the drop sheets and whatnot. So I realized that they were doing some painting and I saw some scaffolding there as well. So then I looked up at the dome again and what did I see? I still saw, I, I saw only the name of Allah there this time, four times. They oh. painted, yeah. So in a, in a way that was a step in the right direction. 
but um, on the and walls how, of how, how long ago? This? this happened about uh, two years ago. Uh, the, the the new uh, uh, paint, the paint when it was painted over. I mean, and when I was at this institute, people would come and go, you know, and I I would speak to them and I would express my concern. I'm not take, trying to take credit for this, of course, by not, not by any means, but I would express my concern that how can they how can the people put the two names side by side when clearly the prophet is a servant of Allah and we, we should not um, you know uh, you know make it look like as if they are some kind of equal equals, you know and a few of them actually uh, agreed with me and they said, yeah, they don't agree with that. So, no, but you know, what you normally get when I express this opinion to, to people, they say, well, but uh, Mr. Abdul Karim, uh, that's my Muslim name, <laughs> how they know me in, my, in Islamic sector, people know me in Islamic sector. We don't want any Wahhabis or Wahhabism here, you know? <laughs> so I, re uh, I replied by saying that, um, you know, if, uh, and did I sound like a Wahhabi, I was informed. So I replied by saying, well, if, to promote uh, monotheism and to 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 reject polytheism is to be a Wahhabi. Then I say I am a proud to be a Wahhabi, because everybody should actually support the uh, you know concept of Tawhid and uh, be opposed to the concept of polytheism. But if you look in the books of jurisprudence, as I did, there are very seldom will you find a section in a book uh, on jurisprudence a section dedicated to the concept of Tawhid. I find this really amazing. Instead, what you find are uh, statements like, I don't want to mention any names because I don't want to embarrass anyone, but you find same statements uh, uh, to the effect that, well, the tafsir of the Quran becomes a part of the Quran. Can you believe this? Yes, unbelievable. The so here the uh, words of human beings uh, again are equated. And in fact, these tafsirs are made part of the Quran. This is tampering with the Quran. How can they possibly do that? That's a very good point, people you know, doing it right now. And this is very uh, dangerous, I think. And the other thing, I think uh, this is very important. A lot of people ask me about this, that does it, I mean, in the Quran itself, does it say that you have to listen to the scholars or person who's like, no more than you who has some kind of qualification, you have to go and listen to them? Because a lot of people right now come and say we are the scholars we have so much research done and you have to listen to us forget about the quran what the quran said we're going to guide you to the right path i mean can you elaborate on that no i think that's totally wrong uh, in fact i think it's uh, it's actually actively discourages people from approaching the quran and and from learning the quran and from following the quran it's wrong to do that and allah talks about people who block uh, uh, people from the way of Allah and this is one of the ways in which it is done there was one uh, Kuwaiti fellow that came to our clubhouse room just the other day and he said his whole life he was following the scholars and the ulama and then finally he started to read the Quran and he had a big shock he said that he realized there was a huge cognitive dissonance here between what the Quran was saying and what the ulama and his friends were saying and I had a very similar experience also when I was in the Islamic sector at the uh, Islamic University when I was reading when I was hearing from my students that the Quran for example abrogated the previous revelations and while at the same time I'm reading the Quran there are 20 verses on this which say that actually the Quran does not abrogate the previous revelations on the contrary it confirms them so something clearly went wrong in exegesis and this is actually the subject of another uh, book, uh, paper i'm working on now how exegesis itself was corrupted by and i'm tracing the problem to the uh, belittling of reason and reasoning because what i see for, uh, from what i have uh, seen what has happened is that the moment the ulama the exegetes uh, belittled reason and basically declared and there's another tradition to that effect the tradition says that the prophet allegedly said that whoever uses his reason to interpret revelation is committing an act of kufr or disbelief now imagine that okay. i'm not allowed to I'm not allowed to use my mind to understand the word of Allah. How can I understand the word, anything, uh, especially the word of Allah, if I'm not going to use my mind? But this is the trap that uh, so many people have fallen into. And uh, this, this uh, negative uh, reaction against reason didn't stop there. That was just the beginning, brother. Uh, what happened every century uh, you can witness, you can see in every century a kind of uh, attack on reason and reasoning. I mean, that's it was, like a to total contradiction <coughs> what Allah says in Quran. Allah saying, 
to use the reasoning and the hadith saying don't use it <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, the Hadith say basically don't use your reasoning, uh, follow the tradition. That is what the traditionists are saying. So they want to, in a way, maintain a monopoly on the interpretation, uh, understanding of the Quran, and they actively discourage people from finding out, from getting knowledge, uh, so that perhaps they can continue to dominate and control the masses. I think that's wrong. But anyway, uh, after this, uh, you know, con uh, belittling of reason in the Hadith, we witness in the 8th century uh, the s a slaughter of 5,000 philosophers. I think we talked about it last time. Right. Mm -hmm. Reported by Suyuti and uh, later reported by Jamaluddin al Afghani in his debate with Renan, the French or Orientalist. Uh, this information is found just for your viewers in case they need to know the reference in a book called uh, Modernist Islam, published by Oxford University Press, edited by Charles Kurtzman. And the references in the article on uh, Jamaluddin al Afghani. So, 5,000 philosophers were slaughtered, the reason, people who use reason. So, uh, and this was in the con this took place in the context of the struggle between the rationalists and the traditionists. Here we, we can see that the tr traditionists won the debate, but that wasn't really a debate. It was not the contest, was not won through argumentation, it was uh, won through. A brutal repression of, uh, you know, through violence, basically. And it didn't stop there. By the way, the outcry seems to be minimal. I only found out about it as it were on the margins of my research. None of my traditional colleagues ever mentioned this to me. So I'm, I'm surprised. Why is no one talking about this? Is this a kind of revision of history? Are we trying to sanitize our own history? Should we be doing that? Isn't it better to be honest and admit, look, we did something wrong here. We need to, we need to uh, rectify it. And the first thing is to acknowledge, yes, we have made a mistake. So let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Unfortunately, it did happen again, maybe not as drastically as that, but in the following century, uh, apparently uh, uh, when the Mutawakil came to power, after the period of the Mihna, the Inquisition, where the rationalists, yes, they committed some excesses uh, and, and tried to enforce the view that, uh, you know, the, the Quran was created and some of the traditions were harmed. Clearly that has happened. But what people don't realize is that after Mutawakil, I believe in 849, they reversed the policy of upholding the createdness of the Quran. Now it was the turn of the rationalists and they were on the receiving end. They're, they lost their jobs, uh, their books were burned. In some cases they were killed, in other cases they had to escape into exile. And for those viewers who would like to find out the details, I would recommend a book by a Pakistani scientist. His name is Pervez Hoodboy and the name of the book is Islam and Science. And the book is available in PDF format free online. So that was a second, as it were, uh, backlash against reason. The third one, there wasn't. There were two more coming. The the third one was the so-called closure of the gates to ijtihad. In other words, reasoning, juristic reasoning, was pretty much shut down. Uh, people declared and, and agreed more or less that uh, the previous prior scholars solved all the problems for the, uh, of the Sharia, and there was no need for any new or additional thinking. So this had a very damaging effect on the development of, uh, you know, knowledge. I think uh, in Islam, and uh, let me just mention the final blow that that happened in the uh, around the year 1000. So we had one uh, event happen in uh, uh, 786. That was the eighth century. Uh, the Mutawakil persecution of the rationalists happened in the ninth century. The closing of the gates, which that happened in the tenth century, and in the eleventh century we had the attack on the rationality once again in the form of the attack by Imam al-Ghazali on the philosophers, whom he declared to be heretics and kafirs. He basically pronounced takfir on them. So, as I argue in this paper, you know, uh, that I'm currently trying to complete, you know, this, uh, this uh, massive uh, belittling or backlash or repression, if you like, of rationality had very serious consequences. Going back to the beginning, the first thing that happened was that the exegetes who didn't want to use their reason to understand the Quran began to find that the Quran didn't make so much sense to them anymore. Why not? Is it maybe because they were not using their reason? Yeah. So they began to claim that there are some ambiguous verses that, that, oh no, it's ambiguous, we don't understand it. Of course, you will not understand it if you don't, don't use your reason, if I can put it bluntly. Not only that, they claim that some of the verses began to appear contradictory to them. Allah is contradicting himself, they claim. Right. Once again, is it because they were not using their reason to its full capacity?
So what did they do when they were encountered with these two challenges of ambiguity and con uh, inconsistency of the verses? To solve the first problem, I use the word in quotation marks to solve the problem, they turned to, they didn't want to use the reason, so what, what was left? They turned to the, the tradition, the Hadith, and they said, no, we, we'll let the Prophet uh, explain it to us. They overlooked the fact that uh, the uh, Quran, uh, only, uh, the, only about 15% of the Quran lends itself to explanation by the Hadith. 85% of the Quran does not have any Hadith to explain it. And another, another problem is, do they really believe that uh, Abu Huraira or whoever can explain better than Allah? I mean, what kind of logical reasoning is it to think that a narrator, a narrator's words, they are not even the words of the Prophet, can somehow explain the allegedly ambiguous verses better than Allah himself? Didn't Allah say about the Quran, didn't Allah say that this is a haza kitabul mumin, this is a clear book, free of ambiguity, free of crookedness, complete and fully detailed? And so now we are advised to turn away from it and go to external sources. To deal with the second problem of inconsistency, they reached out to something completely new, and that is what is known as the doctrine of abrogation. They simply declared that if two verses appeared contradictory to them, the later verse uh, abrogated the earlier verse. And they applied this, for example, to the 120 peace verses. Some, some ulama actually say there were as many as 200 peace verses that were abrogated. But according to, I'm citing now, uh, Muhammad Ghazali, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, uh, you can find this uh, his article online if you type in abrogation and Muhammad Ghazali together. He declared that this entire doctrine of abrogation of the Quran by the Quran is completely uh, bogus and it has no place in Islam. It has to be rejected. In in fact, he used very strong words to condemn this uh, teaching of abrogation, according to which a single verse, the so-called Ayah as saif uh, verse uh, 5, uh, Surah number 9, uh, that this verse abrogated 120 peace verses. I, I find this astonishing. To me, this is a clear case of a breakdown of exegesis. This is a, the, 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 the science has been... I sense a some kind of paralysis going on here. And not only that, it gets worse because once you say 120 pre, uh, verses are abrogated in the Quran, are you not tampering with the Quran? Are you not trying to, uh, changing what the, its message and its meaning? How can they do that? But this is how they turned uh, the so-called religion of peace. We, we, we agree that uh, the Quran teaches peace, but the ulama have reinterpreted by abrogating all the peace verses. They have actually taken the, uh, I don't want to say the heart of, out of the Quran because I think the heart of the Quran is the monotheism, but they have taken out a very uh, important component part of the teaching of the Quran. Uh, they basically kind of like disabled it. And what did they put in its place? they came up with the doctrine of the aggressive jihad, the teaching of aggressive jihad, jihad al-Talab. So now I'm kind of skipping to the end of the process where, uh, you know, uh, even the tradition and the revelation were both overruled or eclipsed by the work of the ulama because they began to claim, I'm referring to Imam al-Karhi, who said that, he was a Hanafite scholar, who said that, and I'm referring to Taha Jabir al-Awani's book called Reviving the Balance, that's where the information is found. He said that if any uh, hadith contradicts what we say, then the hadith should be considered abrogated. And they didn't stop there, they went further. They even had the audacity to say that if any Quranic verses contradicts what we say, then the words of Allah should be considered abrogated or cancelled. Unbelievable. So they, unbelievable, exactly. So they place themselves above Allah. This is absolutely shocking. How could this happen? How come nobody objected? And by the way, John Esposito recognized it in one of his articles. He said that in the end, the Ijma of the Ulama became the top authority and uh, the Sunnah became number two and the words of Allah actually became number three in this pyramid scheme. This is absolutely yeah. shocking. So brother, we have a huge... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, brother Leslie, I'm going to ask you what the, yeah. about the, you think the government has a responsibility and role to play here about the, all the fabrication of revelation. Because it's very important. Well, what recently what happened, probably you heard in Pakistan, and it's on the media, what happened, very uh, uh, a depressing situation, what happened in Pakistan. So you think that the government has to come and tell people that, listen, this is not the way Allah says in Quran, we cannot 
do something like that, killing people and this and that. Even the prophet never allowed this to happen. We have to stop doing that. They have to come and make a statement and also make some kind of laws and rules that this should never happen because it's been happening all the time. Every time somebody do something, say something against the prophet, maybe a minor thing, they're trying to burn everything. They're trying to kill people and they have fights with each other and all that. Don't you think the government has a responsibility and a role to play here? Absolutely, the government has a responsibility to, to uh, show leadership in this issue. And the rest of us too can participate in our own humble ways. Uh, actually, some governments do actually try to, to improve matters. Uh, for instance, as you know, in uh, for instance, here in Malaysia, we had an initiative by the uh, former Prime Minister Tun Haji Abdullah Badawi, who wrote a book uh, called uh, Islam Hadari, and which uh, I have a book review of that on uh, Research Gate and Academia. And in it, he tried to uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, show leadership and provide an initiative to uh, reform not Islam, but our knowledge of Islam. Because Islam, yes, if you understand it correctly, is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the, the Quran. But our knowledge, is it perfect or has it been corrupted? According to some people, and in fact, uh, according to the fellow who edited that book for him, Islam Adari, his name is uh, Taufik Kalatas. I met him once or twice, and he is the son of a well-known uh, Malaysian uh, alim, uh, uh, Professor Nakib Alatas, uh, whose brother, by the way, Said Hussan Alatas, I knew very well, and we were quite close for uh, a year or so plus. So uh, th th our former Prime Minister, Tun Abdul Haji Badawi, actually tried to do just that, and he, in fact, uh, uh, initiated the foundation of the very institute in which I ended up working for nearly 10 years uh, with uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Hashim Kamali, who was the, uh, at that time, uh, who is the CEO of the Institute until this day. Initially, he started out as a chairman also, but uh, later uh, the, the function of the chairman was uh, basically uh, transferred to the former Prime Minister once he was not, I think, busy with so much with after he retired from uh, politics. So yes, this initiative has, uh, there, there was an effort, uh, there is an effort taking place here in Malaysia to that effect. And I know that in Pakistan, when, when Fazlu Rahman tried to, uh, you know, implement uh, the Islamic Research Institute, that was a similar uh, initiative to try to bring um, the Muslims uh, into the age of modernity and so on. But we and uh, by the way, Muhammad Abdu tried something similar in uh, Al Azhar University, but what happens, it, it seems uh, inevitably or invariably, is that the traditional circles are always very opposed to any kind of uh, change because they think that we are, or the reformers, so to speak, are trying to change Islam. That is very far from the case. We are actually only trying to go back to the original Islam, the kind of Islam that was practiced by the Prophet and which did not see this kind of uh, brutal attacks on civilians. We know very well from uh, reliable sources that the Prophet himself was very often criticized, humiliated, and and, uh, and uh, he suffered all kinds of indignities, and he never responded with violence. He was always very patient. So this is actually the Sunnah of the Prophet, and he actually followed the teaching of the Quran, which says in one very important verse, that if someone does something bad to a person, to us, we should reply by doing something good to that person, believe yeah. it or not. Mm -hmm. And that is even better than a Christian turn the other cheek, I think, because, you know, you are going a step further, you know, you're not just prepared to take more punishment, but you are actually responding uh, with something good to something evil. And the verse continues to say that if you do that, then you will see as if by miracle, the two of you that used to be enemies will become like childhood friends. And that's exactly what the Prophet did when he came back from Medina uh, to Mecca at the head of an army of 10,000 armed men at a time at which he could have very easily taken Mecca by force, but he chose not to do that. He chose to follow the Quran, which is the real Sunnah of the Prophet, and he sent gifts, believe it or not, brother, he sent gifts to his, the heads of the, his former enemies. 
and said, listen, we are coming in. If you don't want trouble, just stay inside your homes. We are not looking for trouble. We just want to come here and do, the, you know, do our pilgrimage. And in that way, he managed to reunite uh, the Arabs of the time who were at war until then, as you well know, without really uh, shedding blood. And this was, uh, apart from, uh, you know, a, a marvelous illustration of uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, this was also a, a feat of diplomacy, which is practically unparalleled in human history. He showed excellent leadership and a, a, a fantastic uh, diplomatic skill, skills. How did he do it? By following the word of Allah, that he followed the Quran. So yes, the uh, response to violence and abuse is not to go on a rampage and, and, and to blow people up and whatnot. Uh, go, go to violence but it is i think uh, the best response is to just to counsel the people do something good in return i even mentioned to a few friends you know if you really want to fight the so-called western aggression and we know that some of it has taken place is taking place you know that change this regime or change that regime send a few days over to the united states or to any western company uh, western country and ask them to teach the people there about the true islam and once you get more converts to uh, the faith, then uh, that negativity that some currently non-Muslims, some non-Muslims feel towards Islam should be reduced. And instead of being enemies, perhaps they will have more friends. And in fact, we know that Islam is actually spreading, but those people who are still advocating violence or who still believe in the uh, doctrine of uh, aggressive jihad, they are not helping. They are not helping at all because that th this type of thinking continues to cast Mus uh, Muslims uh, as uh, aggressors and violent people. So we, we should not do that. We should go back to the teaching of the Quran. But to answer your question, to reiterate, yes, the government has a responsibility and not just the government, but also all the institutions that have anything to do with Islam should be doing the same. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Leslie. So what do you think, uh, what is the, the solution right now as far as the, our topic today, you know, the fabrication of revelation, how we can, as far as individual or like community, how we can stop that thing, you know, happening, yeah. happening for I so long? Uh, I think we have to revise the methodology uh, in which we use to understand Islam and to talk about uh, Islam. Uh, and in fact, this is what Abu Habib, Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman said in his book, uh, you know, this uh, Crisis in a Muslim Mind, which was published in 1993, quite early, and reiterated, he reiterated it also in his book, uh, The Quranic Worldview. Something went wrong in this, uh, you know, uh, methodology. And let me just give one example. You see, in the traditional methodology of jurisprudence, we have the so-called roots of the Sharia, the Usul al-Fiqh, we have at the top the Quran, followed by the Sunnah, then that is followed by the Ijma or the agreement of the Ulama, finally followed by uh, Ijtihad or uh, juristic reasoning. There are two or three others, but we don't need to mention them at this point in time. So that's in jurisprudence. Well, what about exegesis? When you look at exegesis, you will find that this ranking is not maintained in exegesis. In exegesis, we no longer find, find the Quran at the top. We find something else. And what is that? The Sunnah. The Sunnah displaces the Quran as the top uh, as it were, reference, on the, on the basis of the claim that the Sunnah judges the Quran, on the basis of the Quran's uh, claim that we need to use the Sunnah to explain and to understand the Quran. So the Quran was relegated under the Sunnah, and uh, uh, in Arabic the expression is uh, a Sunnah Qadi ala Quran. So we have in the first place in exegesis the sunnah then followed by uh, you know uh, the quran and then tradition but even i mean the ijma but even that doesn't last uh, in the end we see that the work of the ulama uh, eclipses even uh, even the tradition or the sunnah both the Quran and the sunnah become subordinated at the end of this process to the work of the ulama because uh, as Taha Jabir Alawani, for instance, points out in his book, uh, Reviving the Balance, uh, what happened was that the uh, initially people used to refer to the Quran, then they turned to the Sunnah, then they uh, pu sh uh, sh uh, pushed aside both Sunnah, uh, uh, Quran and the Sunnah, and they began to refer to the work of the ulama on the grounds that the work of the ulama include already both the Quran and the Sunnah, therefore there is no need to refer to the, the Quran and the Sunnah. As an, uh, one alim uh, from the United Arab Emirates, 
Emirates. His name is Sultan Buti Sultan Ali Al Muhairi. In his two papers on the, uh, the Sharia in the uh, United Arab Emirates, modern and pre-modern period, there are two papers. They are both online. I certainly recommend both. He said that in this process, the Quran and Sunnah became what he called remote sources, remote sources, distant, in other words. And the primary reference became the work of the ulama. But do we get the same uh, quality of guidance from the work of the ulama as we get if we refer to the Quran directly? I have my doubts about that. So what we have witnessed here is actually, I think, a corruption of our knowledge of the Quran through the application of a, a problematic methodology, which assumes that uh, narrators can explain the Quran better than Allah himself, which is up, up, obviously wrong, that a human being can be more clear on a subject than Allah himself, and uh, which also therefore assumes uh, by, by belittling the re uh, reason or rationality, uh, this methodology also um, has to accept uh, the uh, perception that the Quran indeed, I don't believe that, but this is the perception that the Quran contains ambiguous verses and that it contains contradictory verses. These are two assumptions that have really undermined the methodology of exegesis significantly. And finally, with the, the inclusion of the doctrine of abrogation, which is another very problematic part of the methodology or manhaj of Islam, the teaching of the Quran has been corrupted to the point that, uh, and I perhaps I will put it slightly, uh, you know, uh, 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 fairly directly, through the applications, uh, application of this methodology, uh, in particular the doctrine of abrogation, the ulama have managed to transform uh, the religion of peace into a religion of war, exactly the opposite of what it is supposed to be. Right. They, they even declared, and this is not a minority opinion, brother, every single mazhab in the Sunni Islam, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and uh, Hanafi, they all subscribe to this idea that it is a requirement for the Muslims to wage not just defensive jihad. We are, we are required to find not only to defend ourselves, we have to find non-Muslims even when the non-Muslims are not attacking us. In other words, we have to participate yeah, in what is the offensive jihad, the so-called jihad al-Talab. And they made this into a religious requirement into the so-called sixth pillar of Islam. Now, if this is not a corruption of the teaching of the Quran, then I really don't know what it is. So, yeah, this is what has happened. And the, some of the extremists are still, uh, you know, referring to this concept of jihad al-Talab, and they justify their actions by claiming that the peace verses were abrogated and by relying on certain traditions which are very uh, belligerent, bellicose, like the tradition according to which the Prophet allegedly said that I was commanded to fight the kafirs. So what I'm trying to say is that as a result of the flawed methodology, which was basically based on the assumption that we should not use reason to, to understand the revelation, the entire, our understanding and our knowledge of the Quran has become deeply flawed and the uh, reluctance to use reason also uh, uh, enabled so-called unwarranted accretions to enter into the worldview of Islam, all kinds of uh, hadiths which are highly problematic because they were not subjected to a critical analysis or not sufficiently so. So this uh, uh, created, I think, a, a fair bit of confusion, uh, you know, among Muslims also. So we need, to, the this way forward is to go revise the methodology of Islam and we need to as affirm First of all, the primacy of revelation of the Quran over the Sunnah. Then we have to, uh, uh, in other words, we have to subordinate the Sunnah to the Quran, not the other way around. We, uh, and then we have to rehabilitate the reason or rationality. And we don't have to, we, are, we, we, we should not put reason above revelation, no. But we should recognize that reason is a faculty of gaining knowledge of revelation and that we need to use reason at every stage of uh, HDR or every stage of analysis. There's no going around it. So that would be the way forward, I think, to, yeah, to rehabilitate. Right, you're very, very <laughs> well said. Well, that's what I was thinking that I think the problem here right now, there are people following the majority and stop the reasoning uh, mechanism. They don't reason, they don't want to do, you start using reasoning like the Allah says in Quran, you have to be, you know, use, use your senses, start doing the reasoning. They stop doing that and they're following the majority, even though the majority, you know, they're doing the wrong stuff. So that's the problem right now because they're not, you know, they're not using their reasoning. 
which is very important part of your you know creation you know if you don't do stuff with your reasoning you know then obviously there's a problem i mean they're doing stuff they're using the reasoning part in their other uh, you know other life like for example their career and their education and everything else you know buying houses and cars they know which is more expensive less expensive this way we get you more profit they're doing the reasoning there but when it parts when it comes to allah's message they stop the reasoning and then they're just following the majority who are not doing any reasoning so absolutely and on uh, the day of judgment of course we will be asked by allah if we made a mistake why did you do this and we will say well we just followed our chiefs and they misled right. us so every individual has a responsibility to ensure that uh, he's on the right track that he's following the sirat al mustaqim and uh, i might add also that uh, i think in surah 7 verse 33 allah ta'ala made it very clear that we cannot follow anything for which allah has not sent down authority for right. instance the hadith of the tradition where is the authority for following Bukhari in the Quran there isn't any right. so uh, we have to I'm not saying we should reject all the traditions but I'm saying that we should not elevate them to any a level of equality with the Quran or even above the Quran and we should not use them as a basis for Islamic law if you want to use the Hadith um, uh, maybe you want to know how to pray go ahead I have no issue with that if you want to look into Bukhari just don't make it a source of Islamic law because Allah has forbidden judging by anything that he has not revealed so we have to reclassify the hadith and the sunnah as something that is not revelation and that it is uh, in fact there are some ulama who said there's basically two schools here uh, one group says that uh, the hadith it is required to follow them and the other group says that the sunnah is only something that is recommended in other words it is not a requirement mm -hmm. i think we need to go with the second view if you know uh, you know and i don't reject the, the all the hadith outright partly because I want to reach out. To, I have many friends who are, you know, Sunni Muslims, and but they are just following the majority, as you said. And besides, there are many uh, uh, hadiths which contain, you know, some wisdom. I don't deny that. And for instance, uh, if you you should always leave a place in as good a condition as you have found it. To me, that is a valuable, you know, uh, it contains insight. But it should not be part of the deen, as it were. We should not, uh, you know, base, uh, you know, rulings especially on it because. We have seen this before. For instance, you mentioned blasphemy. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah concluded on the basis of six verses that blasphemy is punishable by death. But if you look more closely, you will find that none of the six verses that he mentions, uh, that he refers to, mentions uh, uh, blasphemy, let alone the death penalty. So <laughs> what kind of tafsir is that? You know, and I'm referring to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you can find his reference, uh, you know, uh, online also. Uh, but even a bigger example is the stoning to death for adultery, which has not, not no mention in the Quran whatsoever. The punishment for adultery is a hundred lashes and you need four reliable witnesses to convict someone. And in the entire history of Islam, in 1,400 years, there has not been a single person who was punished with the hundred lashes based on a conviction of four reliable witnesses. It's very difficult to prove. How many, I mean, how many people are going to commit an act like that in public where there are witnesses, of course. But the, the, the supporters of the tradition said no, this uh, verse was abrogated by a tradition, which there are six traditions prescribing uh, death penalty by stoning. So the problem with this is that you, they are allowing the words of human beings to overrule the words of God. My goodness, how can they do that? Yeah. Uh, don't we believe that Allah is the highest authority? That there is no one equal to him and no one above him. Yet here they are placing the words of narrators above the words of God, meaning by implication they are placing these narrators above God himself. Isn't that a kind of really, can I say, relapse into polytheism? Yeah. I mean, it's shocking. It's and something similar applies to the uh, death penalty for apostasy apostasy is treated in the quran as a sin it's not a crime it is punishable in, but in a hereafter but the people who wanted to turn 
the religion of peace into political Islam, they adopted this hadith that the penalty for apostasy is death because they wanted to ensure that they had the political support, the unity, so uh, quote unquote, of the Muslims, especially when they want to wage campaigns of conquest and, and uh, wage this war uh, of the abode of peace, Darul Islam, against the Darul Harb, you know, which is actually an early version, if you look at it closely, of the Samuel Huntington thesis of the clash of civilizations. What is the difference here? You know, uh, some of our friends, uh, you know, in the Western countries believe that they want to spread democracy using the cruise missiles, you know, as demo if, if you think of democracy as a kind of religion. Well, that is a kind of, how, how different is it to, from spreading Islam by force? But the Quran says there's no force in religion like Rafi Din, let him who wants to believe, believe, and let him who doesn't want to believe, uh, disbelieve uh, uh, to you, your religion, to me, my religion. So how, mm -hmm. how did these ulama ever come to the conclusion that Muslims, as a community of, uh, as a people of peace, think of the irony, brother, they say to us, the supporters of this uh, political or you know, no, aggressive uh, Islam of, uh, you know, I don't know, should I say militant Islam, or pro let's call it aggressive Islam or aggressive jihad, they are trying to convince us that we, the people of peace, have an obligation to go to war. Now, what kind of, uh, even when we are not attacked, now what kind of people of peace are we when we are going to war? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. Of course, going to war when you are defending yourself, that makes all the sense. Right. Perhaps you can even make the case that if you see, uh, you know, some minority being uh, mistreated in a neighboring country that you may have, an, uh, uh, you know, an obligation to stop this oppression. There's an argument perhaps to be made there as well, but that is different from just going out and, uh, and conquering other countries and making expeditions far and wide to, you know, to, uh, to conquer, uh, to gain uh, lands for Islam. We have to remember that the Prophet never himself put anyone to death for apostasy. Yeah, And so this hadith that uh, apparently f serves as a foundation for the death penalty for apostasy was reported by Ibn Abba, by Ikrima, going back to Ibn Abbas, who was only 13 years old when he allegedly heard this from the Prophet, but no one else heard it. So how is it possible that such an important uh, law was only heard by a 13-year-old kid? And now we are going to put people to death, entire communities, because we had the wars of apostasy, on the basis of a testimony of a 13-year-old. Where's the mm. logic in that? Where's the no uh, logic. For, no for, logic, yeah. exactly for ordinary crimes? At least two witnesses are uh, required, and they have to be reliable, mature in witnesses who are uh, in control of their, uh, you know, capacities. Yet here we are relying on a statement of, you know, a 13-year-old. Uh, at least. Uh, I can say on the bright side that um, uh, many, uh, quite a few uh, contemporary ul uh, ulama have basically said, I even heard Abdul Habib Abu Sulaiman say uh, directly with my own ears when he visited our institute some time ago that, I quote, there is no death penalty for apostasy in Islam. And this is the view of quite a number of uh, modern, uh, you know, observers. And rightly so, because the Quran does not pres prescribe any such penalty. It clearly contradicts with the principle that there be no compulsion in religion. Hmm. Thank you, uh, Brother Leslie, for your time today. In the end, again, I'm going to ask you if you want to give a message to our viewers. What would be your message today? Well, perhaps I can echo a sentiment expressed by uh, Mustafa Akio, uh, who said uh, he wrote a book recently called Opening the Muslim Minds. Let us open our minds. Let us not be dogmatic. Let, let us not blindly follow authorities. Let us examine and look for proof as Allah, in fact, uh, advises us to do so. In Surah 49, there is a verse which says that if a Fasik comes to us with some news, we have to confirm it and verify it. Otherwise, we might unknowingly and unintentionally harm innocent people and we might feel regrets afterwards. So yes, we need to uh, verify evidence and we cannot simply go on a basis of hearsay or rumors. We have to have a basically a scientific approach. And so we need to uh, re-examine our own tradition and our own methodology. And we need to, especially above all, to rediscover the original teaching of uh, the Quran, which is the higher source of knowledge uh, for Muslims. And uh, of course, for those who are non-Muslims, perhaps they can also look towards the Quran to, to see whether they themselves could not uh, maybe gain some uh, valuable pieces of uh, wisdom from there. So that would be my, my advice. Let us open our minds and let us proceed with caution. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Leslie, for your time. Uh, our viewers, our show is ending. The time is ending. Please uh, take care of yourself, your family, your neighbors. 
try to read uh, understand quran every single day assalamu alaikum take care walaikum walaikum salam and thank you too